Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walsh, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. Today, we have a very special guest, Marguerite Mariscal, the CEO of Momofuco. Uh, when we created this show, we really wanted to teach restaurant owners about the new economy the new economy. And instead of just focusing on a standard restaurant PL, we have to think differently. That is why we are a barbecue media company. That is why we believe in smartphone storytelling. That is why we believe every restaurant business should be an e-commerce business. Momofuco has literally built this incredible brand, this omni-channel brand. Um, they are leading by example, and we're so excited to have Marguerite on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I, we start with our favorite random question, and that's where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Ooh, um, I would have to say maybe the Hollywood Bowl. I think like being outdoors while at a concert, while I'm pretty sure they sell like whole bottles of rosé, which is not the thing <laughs> that uh, most, most stadiums would. Um, yeah, it's just a lovely, lovely place. So Marguerite, we're going to go to Hollywood Bowl. I'm going to convince Toast, who's our, our title sponsor. Um, I'm going to convince Entrepreneur. We're going to get them to sponsor this incredible hospitality event. And I'm talking not just your standard conference, but people that are playing the game within the game, the best restaurant groups, the best hospitality professionals. I'm going to put you on center stage, and I'm going to let <laughs> you give a two-minute presentation. For those that don't know, the, the woman behind David Chang's restaurant empire, the new, the new CEO, please, uh, please let, let the audience know who you are and what you do. <laughs> I hope we'd have better uh, entertainment than me at this concert, but. Um, no, <laughs> no this I... is, this is, this is, this is for us hospitality nerds. <laughs> the ones that love that, that love the, uh, the, the food that we bring to, to all of our communities all over the world. Okay, so uh, I'm Marguerite Mariscal. I grew up on the Upper West Side. Uh, my family is in hospitality. They own uh, grocery stores um, uh, on the Upper West Side where uh, I grew up. And so uh, I never really thought I wanted to get into restaurants. Um, as everyone I'm sure listening to this podcast knows, um, it's not an easy business. My grandpa would constantly be talking about how slim the margins are. You work on holidays. Um, and so uh, I started to look into uh, internships and things with media companies. So I worked at, uh, uh, interned at the Sundance channel, uh, NPR selected shorts, just kind of more like storytelling brand, um, like strong identity places. Um, and then when I graduated from college, I worked at, uh, my, uh, uncle's farmer's market, which I thought would be fun, but it was absolutely not. It was uh, a lot of hard work, but I, I really think it taught me everything, you know, that I needed to know in terms of working, you know, six to six. And you're the person who puts, you know, uh, the planters out front. You're the person who brings them back at the end of the day. I think it really taught a lot about uh, kind of ownership and management. Um, but anyway, after that worked uh, uh, at Momofuku, I saw an internship. So I, I clicked and uh, come October, it'll be 11 years at Momofuku. And uh, I think I really came at it as if it was a brand, very similar to the places that I worked before. Um, Dave was doing really interesting things at that time. He just started Lucky Peach, Mind of a Chef, uh, just came out on television. Um, you know, and it really, to me, was more than just the restaurants. It was the restaurants as almost like the physical manifestation. But then, you know, there was kind of a uh, uh, dialogue, like kind of discussion around things like MSG, um, you know, why pasta can cost way more than noodles, right? And just all these conversations that were happening that uh, were perfect for the time. And so um, I hopped on and I've, I've been there ever since. You know, I think it's really fascinating for me, I, you know, as a single unit barbecue restaurant owner for so long until 13 years till we added other locations, but I would also put out job posts for interns. And, you know, it's just not something that happens in restaurant business, unless you think of yourself differently. And yeah. unless 
you understand how much the world is changing because of the internet. Can you talk about what that job post said, what you took from that job post and why more restaurants should really be tapping into not just the boots on the ground, but we talk about smartphone storytelling. I mean, for us, we're trying to figure out how do our hospitality hosts, how do our managers, how do our pit masters, how do we start to use more storytelling video, these social platforms. But in order to do that, you need to have a team. You know, you can't yeah. just expect them to go and execute, you know, what we all need for our social media, digital media storytelling. Can you can you bring us back to to back when when you started and where the social media landscape was? Sure. It's a great, great question. And I, I really think I was I was extremely lucky with my timing. So it was 20 uh, the fall of 2011 and uh, Twitter had just really started percolating up as a way for um, brands, restaurants, everyone to really directly communicate with their customers in a way that wasn't uh, possible before. And then I actually launched um, our Instagram account as a as an intern. Um, and you know, I remember like the first post was like of our office dog, and it said like hashtag office dog, like not good content, <laughs> but you know, but but just started it. And um, that's amazing. And it was really the big, <laughs> yeah, it's like I'll never like you know, it's like I can never escape that. Um, but. It was really amazing because it was the first time you had this platform, which was visual, which is like perfect, right, for restaurants capturing new dishes. I remember we made a point, um, you know, to your comment on storytelling, like we were going to post photos of family meal. Like, I don't think anyone had like seen family yes. meal from at restaurants just because it, it just never happened. and It was never anything, um, you know, that the press would focus on, right, obviously, yep. because it was uh, behind the scenes. And so... I think we really saw all these platforms and we later started a Tumblr, which was another way for us to like tell longer form stories. But we, for the first time, really had the tools to kind of, you know, our, our thesis was, you know, what stories do we want to tell that yeah. the media might not be excited about, but we're super excited about. So, right. you know, we had a restaurant, you know, get in a, um, a whole, you know, uh, cow and, you know, the process of breaking that down, what that allows you to do. Um, and what it allows you to serve, you know, compared to if you were to buy pieces, like all this stuff that like, you know, I would say we're talked about in pre-shift, talked about with the team, but never really expressed outside of it. So it was a really interesting uh, time. And uh, I was very lucky to be there, like right at the beginning of it. So uh, let's go back to the Instagram account because it's fascinating to me. Uh, Momo Long Play. So it's at yeah. Momo Long Play. You guys have over 600,000 followers on IG. What, why, why Momo Long Play? So the idea was it was like uh, there's EPs and there's LPs. So uh, oh. it was uh, the long play. It was like, you know, everything. Um, and, you know, I think for us, uh, it was about like kind of telling that ballistic story um, and, you know, I, I really credit, you know, obviously I, I don't do it anymore. Um, very thankfully they took it away from me, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, it, I think it's always been popular because it's never been about just, you know, this special tonight, we're open these hours. It's always been about that storytelling. So you yeah. could live, you know, uh, a thousand miles away from one of our locations and there's still value to following and you're still understanding um, what's going on uh, in our restaurants and in, in further afield. So one stat that I'm obsessed with, um, which we realized during the pandemic, is that uh, between Dave and Momo, and Dave has has way more followers than Momo, uh, and collectively it's more than 2 million uh, on Instagram, 90% of those uh, people don't live in cities in which we operate. Amazing. So there's always been this like massive audience that once again, is not following us to know about what's happening tomorrow. Right. And so, um, and I really credit our team for building that because you don't get there by not telling stories, by not, you know, having just like visually, you know, delicious food that anyone can appreciate, even if you don't get to eat it. So uh, I totally echo what you're saying on kind of the importance of, um, thinking not like, you know, purely, what do I have to do? What do I need to put up there? Uh, but also really looking at, at the broader picture of, of who you can inspire and who your potential, you know, customer, especially if you start talking about omni-channel can yes. be. Um, and I think that that's, that's super, super interesting. And then the one thing I would add, which I also thought was amazing, because I agree with you, you need a team, but I think also culturally things started to change where you know, we used to get sent from the restaurants, like, you know, and keep in mind, cell phones have also gotten so much better. We would get like <laughs> <Pretty good. laughs> horrible photos of, yes. of food. And it's like, 
oh, well, like maybe you should try like bringing it into the front of house, you know, like maybe some natural light and really, or trying to, it ultimately got to a point where we had chefs sending us like impeccable photos that they had sent us, you know, they spent time, you know, like, like directing, placing, plating, uh, because they understood it, right? They understood like, oh, we want to be on the Instagram that that's like good for us. And so I would say that culturally there was just a shift, you know, from 2011 to, you know, 2004, where the quality just got so much better and the interest of the back of house, the front of house in social media got, you know, so much more investment. Um, Because at the beginning, it was very much like, you know, me running around with a cell phone. And then eventually, (laughs) you know, it was great to see things start flooding in, right? Because people understood the, the value of social media. And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to welcome our newest sponsor to the show, and that is Davo Sales Tax. Davo is an incredible company. I remember when we first opened up our restaurant in 2008, Cali Barbecue, we were struggling to figure out how to automate sales tax, how to have enough money in our account to file our quarterly taxes. I am so grateful that now, today, we have found Davo and they are a sponsor of the show and they are excited to help other business owners no longer have to become tax collectors. Davo does it all for you. They take care of the compliance, they take care of the collecting, they take care of the filing. Get your first month free by going to davosalestax.com slash influencers. Let them know that we sent you. Davo is an incredible company. We're grateful to have them on the show. They integrate with all the top POS companies, including Toast. DavoSalesTax.com slash influencers. Automate your sales tax today and get back to running your business. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm obviously fascinated by it. We opened our restaurant in 2008 and I always talk about the day that the first iPhone came out because it was yeah. 2007, you know, June 2007 and where we see the restaurant landscape, the food landscape, this e-commerce ability, like you said, all of these people that David is impacting, that Momofuko is impacting, that aren't in the village. You're not really next to the restaurant to enjoy the restaurant, but the fact that here, I'm here in San Diego and I can go on Gold Belly and order food shipped directly to me. Can you talk about your partnership with Gold Belly and why it's important for restaurants to think beyond their local cities, their local communities, their local village? Yeah, um, I, I think Gold Belly and, and our home cooking products are two examples of really trying to break out of the four walls of uh, of the restaurant. And, you know, going back to that 90% on Instagram, like there's always been this audience, right? And typically they'd be able to, you know, maybe they'll visit you in Las Vegas when they're there, they'll visit you in New York once a year, but giving that opportunity to kind of engage, uh, you know, any day of the year, um, was really new for us. And, you know, there's something also really nice, I would say about, you know, it is a really direct, because it's, you know, direct to consumer, it is this really direct interaction, right? Like it is, um, you know, in some ways, you know, something we talk a ton about is we have more data in a lot of ways on our um, our customers that we ship things to online, yes. right? Than we do of the people walking into our restaurant, right? Like Or, your, you or, have- or third-party delivery. Totally. Totally. So it's, you know, we're able to see where it's going, how often are people ordering, you know, like tendencies, um, which then helps us, right, continue to to get better um, or acknowledge those individuals. But, you know, that always obviously like being a, uh, we call them PXs, but like, you know, a VIP, a regular in restaurants has always been this kind of like organic process, at least in, you know, obviously there's the you know, buy nine, get one free idea of loyalty, but at, um, you know, finer dining restaurants, it's always been kind of this art, right? Where you kind of bring people in, send them an extra dish, you know, you're trying to to get them into this system. And it's been amazing to see with all these direct to consumer mechanisms, you know, how, how kind of easy that is. Um, And it makes me jealous of, you know, why can't we have that on the restaurant side where you can, you know, very easily see, Hey, who are my top 10 customers? Yep. And you know, how can I reach them to reward them? Right. And I think that's uh what you know it's it's been really interesting to have another window into a whole other type of uh exchange, right? And sure. kind of learn from it and try to pull that back into the restaurants. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, that's something that our deep thesis is in digital hospitality and it's understanding how do we do what we do so well as restaurant owners. We do it so well in real life. How do you yeah. extend that omni-channel yeah. onto all these different totally. platforms? You know, once you're on Instagram and TikTok and LinkedIn and, you know, buying things through Goldbelly, buying things through Uber Eats, you know, online ordering through your website, but then how do you customize that digital experience the same way that Amazon does, you know, because when I go on Amazon, it's different than when my wife goes on Amazon and it's custom to me. And as restaurant owners, we need to do that better. And we need to lean yeah. on our tech partners to help us do that better. What, are, what is Momofuku doing to, to try to address that? Uh, you know, it, I think loyalty is probably the general bucket. We call it like CRM loyalty. Like it's something that we've been trying to solve since like day one. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I think especially having multi-unit, but having multi-unit that are not all the same concept, right? And then, as you said, layering on all these ways to engage on different platforms, it's yeah. like next to impossible. Like it's so hard yeah. um, to get there. And, you know, we thought about things, you know, I remember we had this crazy idea, like maybe five or six years ago of uh, almost treating it like an airline where it's like spend equated to you know if you reach x amount of spend then you get yep. this perk and you can level up and you could be gold or platinum and you know and and uh, someone once said this to me which is one of my favorite expressions is uh don't let ideas collapse under their own weight and that was 1000 <laughs> percent an idea that collapsed under its own yes. weight it was like so many different pieces who's going to manage this dashboard who's yes. going to be like you know booking these people you know vips reservations and it just never happened. And so I think for us, it's really almost trying to start smaller, you know, and yeah. kind of like, okay, what can we do today to make this a little better? Like, uh, okay, we're opening a new restaurant. Let's email um, just this group that we've amassed first and have them, you know, uh, have access to reservations or um, with the uh, home cooking products, we're starting a uh, Facebook uh, group where it's kind of our top users and we can yeah. identify them. And it's like, we want to hear what you think. We want to like give you products first because you're the people that are going to give us real feedback. And as I said, it's a little easier on that side. Like I wish I could do the same thing for our regulars in the restaurants where it's like, hey, uh, you know, we just started doing this large format. We want you guys to be the people that come in first and try it and give us feedback. And there's friends and family, which is, you know, a structured way of doing that. But, you know, I think that it's, I don't know if we've cracked the code. I think it's gotten... What I would say is as the technology has gotten better, and by better, I mean not just more useful, but also more like open source, right? Yeah. And your ability yeah. to have access to those customers, it's going to get easier. So for example, um, you know, we're moving all the restaurants that we can uh, all to Toast. So we have one single platform there. Really? We made, Amazing. We made an F yeah, we made an effort to get uh you know as many restaurants as we can onto resi because once you start having common languages uh, yep. amongst them that's when all these things start clicking a lot better Absolutely. and and i'm sure people who own multiple restaurants might be able to relate to this it's like it's kind of silly how many times you end up with like three pos systems because this partner requires this one and you know oh we have that one and you know the contract expires in like three years yep. so we're gonna keep it till then and so I think a big, big push for us in the past couple of years is like streamlined systems that yes. once you have those streamlined systems, then you can start talking. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny to think, you know, we're a 18 year old, uh, company at this point, and, you know, we're just kind of getting to that <laughs> alignment, uh, of, of those different, uh, pieces of technology because they haven't made it easy, um, in, in order to kind of string all these things together. I mean, I can't even imagine. We were with Aloha for 12 years before we switched yeah. over to Toast. And it was a very big switch for us because of the time and investment that my business partner, totally. and manager, Eric, had spent on the system, literally building our entire restaurant on this on this system and then switching over to Toast. But once we did, we started to realize all of the benefits. Can you talk yeah. us through? I mean, Toast is the title sponsor of the show. I had no idea you guys were on Toast. So that, <laughs> that's that's amazing. Can you talk us through the multi-unit decision to go to a, t a technology partner like Toast? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the pandemic really, I think, like opened everyone's eyes, I think, to a lot of the pros of something like Toast. And, you know, I, I think the best example I can give is in, we were using it in LA since opening uh, at a restaurant, Majordomo. 
and their ability during the pandemic to flip on delivery yep. and pick up, sorry, like through their own system. And, you know, the GM could go in and program their items. They could update them. Like it was just the smoothest of transitions. Yeah. Um, and then meanwhile, you know, in New York City, we're like building a Shopify site <laughs> to then, you know, like sell uh, both songs. Like it was just like such a, you know, it was a suck on everyone, right? It's a suck on yep. time. It's a suck on, uh, and, and, and at the end of the day, I don't think it was the product we wanted, right? Like it was an interim solution. And so, I think, you know, as, you know, and I think Momofuku, I'm going to say more than other restaurants, but you would have maybe more experience talking to as many people as you do. I think we're extremely committed to an omni-channel approach, regardless of how things move forward. Like yes. for us, it is like core to our business um, and will be. And I've seen a lot of restaurant groups start to kind of like tilt back and, you know, if they can just do seven services a week you know, indoor dining, mm -hmm. then like, that's what they want to do. And I think for us, and, and keep in mind, we're, we're fortunate. We have, as you mentioned, we have teams, we have people that can kind of yeah. work on this. We have a tech team. They can, you know, uh, uh, figure out how to move forward on a lot of this stuff. And I understand for, for like an owner operator of a single unit, it's really hard to commit all the time to these different sure. pieces. But, but I think for us, Toast is almost like the more future-proof solution, which yeah. as you know, who knows what's going to happen next, but I would bet on a company like Toast figuring out how to respond to it much quicker and much better than what we've seen uh, from the big players that sure. are just way more slow moving. Well, I mean, I think what's exciting for me when I talk to restaurant owners and I talk to tech CEOs and, you know, people that are, you know, playing the game within the game, it's exciting for me as a restaurant operator to know that when you find a company like Toast and there's leadership at the top, they understand that they don't have everything figured out, but they're committed to working with groups as small as I am and as big as you are to know that my restaurant's completely different than your restaurant in LA is completely different than the place in Vegas, completely different than the places in Canada. And like, they will be better with the more feedback that we give them. Yeah. And I know it seems onerous on a lot of restaurant owners that are probably listening to this, but honestly, the best companies, the best tech companies, they will take that feedback and make it better. Like they yeah. are, they need to have hospitality just as much as we do. And the more hospitality that they provide us, the better products that they can make so that we can go and do what we want to do. Completely, completely agree. And I think there's people in other spaces that, you know, are trying to do something similar. And I, I really think too, like even Resi, um, just the access to like the customers, right. Yes. That we have, uh, compared to the, the open table days. Um, you know, and that for me, for me, really, it's like owning as much of our customer as we can. And, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I really think we need to like, just as a business or as a, uh, industry, you know, there's always been these kind of gatekeepers to like your information, your customer, yep. And, you know, I, I think the big push, whether it's Toast, whether it's what Resi was able to do, and I'm sure there's going to be a million, you know, people that come after that, that make it even better. But, you know, whenever you can have access, whatever gives you more access to your customer is, is in my opinion, like the way to go. Um, and, you know, Momofuku, you know, for better or for worse, uh, you know, built its own reservation system in 2008 with the launch of Co because there wasn't anyone responding to what we were yep. meeting, which is like, yep. you know, which, which has become, you know, with, with systems like talk, like very normal, right? It's like, we only have these slots. <laughs> you need to be able to like use a credit card to pre-book it. And, yep. you know, and, and it needs to be able to understand different configurations of tables, have some of those block out the large formats were, were a, a beast. Um, and, you know, and I think maybe as we've gotten smarter, as a restaurant group, you know, it used to be like, we, we literally to this day, we built our own internet, which we use to this day. And like every day I pray that it like survives another day. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we used to be like, we're going to build our own technology. We're going to yes. do this or that. And, and I think it's a combo of technology and hospitality getting better yep. and also us realizing what we're good at. And I yes. think that the combo has moved to us seeking out more partners um, and less so trying to solve these problems in house. And I think it's been, you know, obviously you don't get everything you want, but it, it's, I think the, the right move and it definitely took us time, but, um, 
you know, I, I think that's like, it's just a totally different landscape than 2011 yeah. Uh, yeah. than today. It's, it's interesting. And it's, it, it goes back to, you know, the, you thinking like an e-commerce company, acting like an e-commerce company, selling products online. It's something that we talk to restaurant owners all the time. And can you walk us through your process? What's the process of how do you make sure that the products that you're going to sell um, drop shipped or you're going to sell through Gold Belly, they're going to be the Momofuku brand? Yeah. I mean, a ton of stress testing, I would say. I think, you know, for us, um, and that's number one. The number two, number two thing, which I actually think is, is good advice that I think we've learned over time is I think there's a lot of people that are, you know, when they're doing something like Gold Belly or they're making, you know, home cooking products, they're obsessed with having it be as close to what, you know, you get in the restaurant, right? And, but that sometimes actually makes the product worse, right? Because in a restaurant, you know, yes. whether it's like you cook it out, new, whatever it is, right? It is the way that it is there. Yep. And trying to just then ship that to someone, yep. right? Or like bottle that, it's not necessarily going to have the same reaction or the same taste once it's out of your four walls. And so I think something that we use as a thesis is like, at the end of the day, it needs to just be the most delicious version yes. of it. So if that means, for example, when we ship bosoms, it's not the same set you get in the restaurant because like that same set, you can't like, you know, whether it's too much work for someone to do at home, but honestly, it's just like, it's not going to ship and hold up to our standards. So we've created like a updated uh, assortment of things that come with it that we think is actually the better tasting solution for shipping. And same with like, you know, the things that we make, um, our sauces, um, all the things that we ship, uh, you know, direct to consumer, uh, the home cooking stuff. It's like, our goal is just to make something that's restaurant quality, meaning we use it in our restaurants. But if we tried to, you know, one example, I want to make ginger scallion sauce so bad uh, because it's one of my favorite things. I always make it. Uh, but if you make it, you know, it's like once you basically combine like sherry vinegar with scallions, you know, it's like it's not the shelf life is yep. just it's not there. It's like best made, you know, right before you eat it. And so like that's something that's like would I love to sell it. Yes. But we're not going to get there until we believe that there's a way of doing it, that it's like going to have the reaction that when you eat it at the restaurant it has. And so I think people get a little too obsessed with like one-to-one -one mirroring. And yes. I think people have to look at it more from, you know, stress test. And it's like, what's going to be the best thing that someone opens and try to design that, even if it's not exactly like what you do in your restaurant. Um, and so we've kind of had to like, let go of some of that um, and prioritize just the customer experience over, you know, it being verbatim uh, what we do in-house. Yeah, that's uh, very important. It's something I, I would liken to barbecue competitions when you're cooking for one single Kansas City Barbecue yeah. <laughs> Society judge, they're biting one piece, they're getting one bite of brisket. But then when you're yeah. trying to serve hundreds of customers at your restaurant, you're obviously not going it's, to, it's a different process. So, you know, totally. extending that on, I think that that's great advice. Um, you guys are in over 2,500 stores across the United States. Is that, is that, is that where we are right now? Yeah, no. So it's been, I mean, the retail expansion has been, been <laughs> nuts. Um, and it just, it moves so quickly. I mean, when you're talking about, um, you know, Target and Whole, Whole Foods, Foods, these like yeah. large, large distributors. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think our growth is something, I mean, just in general for the CPG company, our growth is I think 130% uh, year over year. Um, wow. But if you look specifically at retail, it's something like 300% growth, but mostly wow. just because we weren't in retail, you know, uh, before, before 2021. So for us, it's been a big push. Um, but, you know, I think, I think similar to what you were saying about, you know, like catering versus cooking for one judge, I think yep. there's something like, there's kind of like a beauty, I would say, uh, which, you know, I think the restaurants, what's beautiful about restaurants is that you know, it's basically every night is like a dance, right? And you're trying to, yeah. to, you know, hit everything, you know, hit everything exactly right, you know, salt, you know, everything like needs to be spot on. And there's something beautiful in that. But there's also something beautiful in creating something and having that be able to be in 2,500 stores. Um, when, you know, it's like, it's, it's funny. It's like, you almost see this work that you put in like really just like have 
so much return, right? And so yeah. much, like the scalability is so different than, you know, we could open 10 noodle bars and that wouldn't do the Correct. same thing, right? Like it's Correct. it's going to be so reliant on the people in the kitchen and the teams out front getting it right. And, you know, I love that process and that's, you know, never going to go away, but it is kind of incredible to like make a, a chili crunch and be like, oh, that, that's delicious. Yes. And then have that show up around the country and have it be exactly the recipe that you decided on every single time. And don't get me wrong, work goes into that in terms of scaling up the recipe, exactly to your point about, you know, one versus 3000. Um, but once you get it right, it's this like amazing thing to really see. So um, that's been been pretty awesome. And I think for us where we're really excited and I think I can't, maybe you can think of examples. I haven't really thought of or been able to see another restaurant group that's trying to do what we're doing, which is we want like the fact that we have restaurants and we have these home cooking products, like we want it to be this symbiotic relationship yes. where they, they feed each other. And so often you see brands either like sell off the rights to their CPG products and have someone else run it or companies see it as like, oh, sure, we'll, we'll bottle our sauce and it'll just be this thing that we kind of, you know, we offer it, but we don't really promote it. We're not really pushing to do it at scale. And what we're trying to do is leverage the fact that we have these restaurants and, you know, and, and similarly leverage these restaurants to develop these recipes. And so, you know, I think for 2023, we're really looking forward to like pushing that even further. So, you know, you should be able to get chili crunch on the table at Noodle Bar, right? Yeah. You should be able to see these kind of intersections of these two worlds um, in a way that, you know, I think is really exciting. And it'll be, you know, an experiment almost of like, what does that do? How does that create a halo around, you know, both of these aspects of a business um, together? So that's what we're trying, you know, and, and you'll see it in, in our content, right? It's like chefs cooking recipes, utilizing the products, um, which, you know, I think, our ability to engage with users in that way is, is, you know, very different than a lot of uh, these home cooking products. Yeah. I mean, it's super exciting for us. This is why we launched the show restaurant influencers to talk about content, to talk about storytelling, to talk about commerce. Um, you know, when you see Mr. Beast go into a mall in Jersey <laughs> yeah. and have 10,000 people show up to a restaurant opening, I mean, anyone that's in the restaurant business, I, I don't know if you're terrified or if you're impressed, like, yeah. what are you going to do like, with it? Yeah. You can't ignore like, it. You can't yeah, ignore what it. are you going to do with the 9,000 people that you can't serve that day? But nonetheless, <laughs> Less, I mean, that's the exciting thing when you think about what David's doing on Netflix. He's creating yeah. these incredible shows. He's creating incredible podcasts. You can go to the restaurants. You can order on Gold Belly. You can purchase the product. You can enjoy in your home this Momofuku experience. You can get the cookbook. You know, you're sharing the secrets and all these different touch points. Back to what you talked about when you were running the, the social, when you were running Instagram and you're sharing the family meal. I mean, I think, you know, if people are listening to this show, you know, we have so many incredible operators. It's show the things that are true to who you are and your character. It doesn't matter how many people like it. That's what's compelling. Like that's the yeah. compelling point. And that's the thing that launches the, the legends, you know, it's how does a story become a legend? It becomes a legend because so many people continue to go and tell your guys' story. I'd love before, before I let you go, I want you to talk about how important design is. Because uh, I think, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think it's prioritized in enough restaurants and with enough restaurant groups, the way that you guys prioritize it. So, uh, yes, I'm, so I started like my, it was social and design, like the two things that I, I was really, uh, obsessed with. I think they were also the two things that like other people didn't necessarily want to do. So it like became my, uh, my, my pet projects. Um, and you know, one of my favorite stories is I was, uh, so my job as an intern once again, uh, was to update all of the restaurants menus, uh, online. Um, for, cause that was a new thing that, you know, you, you could go every day and look up, uh, what was being served. And, and I would update sometimes the, um, uh, menus within the restaurants and like, uh, I noticed, so the, the font that, you know, is on noodle bars, uh, menu forever was century Gothic. And I was looking at their menu and I realized that the font that the menu was, was actually just like the default font from when a computer doesn't have the right one. And so I was like the person who was kind of like very into the details, very into having everything. Um, 
you know, kind of uh, fit fit this, um, you know, your point on the website should be reflective, yes. you know, it should be utilizing the same fonts, it should be, you know, having this similar look and feel. Um, so we utilized a ton of imagery from the cookbook on the website. So it's like, how do you make everything kind of feel part of a whole? Um, yeah, and, and I would just say, like, I think for, for me, and this is like a very Momofuku thing is, you know, it, it should always be, you know, I don't think design, at least for us, you know, there are groups that do this phenomenally, but at least for us, design should never be the focus. It almost needs to be, you know, it needs to match the food and it needs to allow you to enjoy the food. So, you know, if, if uh, and also I think like, you know, this is like, I think that Dave really uh, was at the beginning of, but also just kind of having a, uh, form, you know, uh, follow function where, you know, I love one of my favorite de design features at our restaurants is we utilize uh, glass refrigeration to basically store uh, proteins that are aging, but also just, you know, whatever we need for that day. And so you have these kind of stunning uh, cases that are both like art or, you know, something that, uh, you know, the customer can enjoy, but also it's, it's something useful for the restaurant. And so, I think wherever you can kind of find that intersection of something that's not designed for design's sake, but serves this dual function for, for, you know, your needs, um, like that is, I think, you know, the best designs, uh, that, that we've had. And so, um, but yeah, no, it's something that I, uh, you know, I, I still like poke my head in and try to be involved in as much as I can, just because <laughs> I really do think it's, uh, that's the fun stuff, you know? Absolutely. Have you gotten any feedback from other women um, that have seen what you've done and seen you in the New York Times and these Forbes articles on entrepreneur from intern to CEO of this restaurant empire? Have, have you gotten feedback? I, I would say it's less focused uh, on, on women and more focused on just the journey, like going from intern to CEO, I think, especially these days where you don't see, I mean, especially in the hospitality industry, yep. you know, retention yep. at that scale that often, I think, um, you know, I think for a lot of younger individuals that are just starting out, it is kind of like this, you know, this could be you, this could, you know, you're here, you, you can get there. And I, I think that's like an amazing story and um, something that I hope, you know, uh, people can emulate. And so, you know, and I think that hospitality is almost also an industry where that is possible, right? Because formal training is not necessarily, you know, the the bread and butter of the industry, right? It's people coming in, yeah. working, and and you know, and continuing to to evolve, grow, move up. So, um, yeah, I hope that's something that that people can take away. In in the hospitality business, we do such a good job of taking care of the village, taking care of our teams. Yeah. Very rarely, as leaders, do we take care of ourselves. What what do you what do you do to take care of yourself now that you have such a high profile job? Uh, that's such a good question. I should have a good answer to this. I probably, <laughs> you know, to, be, to be completely honest, am I calling you, know, you I think, out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a good call out. I think a lot of people don't take as good care of themselves as as uh, they should, right? And it's like the same thing of when you're on an airplane, like put your mask on first yes. before you can help someone else. So yes. one thousand percent that is the right mentality. Uh, I would say that I, uh, like many people got a dog during the pandemic, um, which I think in a really good way, like forces me to, you know, step out of, uh, you know, emails, step out uh, from my computer, my office and, uh, you know, actually get out there. So um, I take her to off leash every morning uh, in awesome. uh, prospect park. So that's like a great way to start the day. There you go. So every uh, Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time and uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, we do a clubhouse call on the audio app clubhouse. And we like to support the people that are supporting this show. We're so grateful that, you know, with this show, we've reached millions of people since we launched in January. It's uh, it's very humbling to know, but um, very exciting as well. But this week's social shout out is going to go to Aaron Roberts, who is on my Rising Tide Creative. He is the CEO of Rising Tide Creative, but he answered a call when I was looking for a media intern um, back in the day when we became from when we went from a barbecue brand to a barbecue media company. And he's doing some incredible work. So Aaron, keep up the great work. Um, keep putting out content. But I want to ask you, who, who do you want to shout out? Who's who's the intern that's that's uh, going above and beyond since this is on Entrepreneur? 
Uh, oh, now I'm putting I, you on the great... spot because you have a thousand. No, 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 you have no, no. a thousand employees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is not. You know, there's a, a million all stars, but I would, I would shout out uh, this guy Eric Bees, who was an intern for us at Momofuku, was a champ. Would bring us uh, pineapple cakes, and uh, you know, kind of kept in touch. And he now operates uh, two restaurants in New York. One's called Eight Eight Six, and one's called Wen Wen, and it's getting like crazy press um and they're both Taiwanese they're awesome Amazing. um and so it was so cool to see like uh you know I I don't know how much uh he learned from us but I think he's just naturally talented great guy but it's so cool to see someone you know uh start out in a role similar to mine and, and now have his own his business and I would not be surprised if, you know, there's, there's a lot more to come. So that's, amazing. that's my, that's my shout out. He also yeah. brought me, uh, uh, Szechuan peppercorns from China during the pandemic, which, you know, I was, was a Holy grail, uh, acquisition. Uh, so <laughs> my shout that out is, for that, so. that is awesome. <laughs> So if you guys want to connect with me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. And that's on all the social platforms, TikTok, IG, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, where can people find you if they want to connect? Momofuko. Momo yeah, long play. Definitely, definitely get on the get in the IG. Um, you guys yeah. are getting active on Twitter. I mean, on TikTok, excuse me, on, on TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it. You can't hide from We're me. Gonna, I'll, I'll call anybody out on their TikTok content. You're trying. You guys will dominate TikTok. We're, we're just getting started. We're, exactly. we're really just getting started. Um, and, and we have, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, people on our teams that are, you know, way wiser uh, in those ways than me. I've, I've hung up my, uh, my, my professional social cap yeah. uh, uh, for now. <laughs> Uh, it's always it's always in you when it's in you it's in you um <laughs> so please go check out the website i love what you guys have done with the texting um the text community that you have the email community the website's very sexy it's very well done um you can buy the products you can check out all the locations um and thank you so much i really really appreciate your time and uh, if you're ever in san diego if anyone from the team is in san diego please give us a shout yeah, let us know uh, whenever you're you're anywhere. Or, you know, I guess now we can reach you where you are. Maybe maybe we'll get some gold belly. But thank you. This is uh, this has been great. Really fun. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. We will catch you guys next week. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. I will get you the link to the right Toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show, that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about Toast, you implemented Toast, you did a Toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your Toast story with us. DM me today to learn more and be sure to check out Toast.